Welcome to Exile Catlin Arctic Live. We're here at the UK Arctic Research Station in Nielsen, Svalbard. And that's about halfway between the top of Norway and the North Pole. We're here conducting a series of live broadcasts via the Digital Explorer YouTube channel. Um, so please do join us there. Uh, we're currently streaming. And this is an open Q&A, an Ask Me Anything session um, from the Arctic for schools around the world. So what we'll be doing is taking some of the pre-submitted uh, questions. Ellie, who's currently behind the camera, will be uh, joining me shortly. And we'll also be taking questions from the live chat, so please do keep those questions coming in. Our role on Arctic Live is to conduct science here in the frozen north, and that's research into ocean acidification and microplastics. And it is also to work to share that with as many classes around the world as possible. So thank you so much to all those teachers, educators, technicians and librarians who are making it possible uh, for their classes and students to join us here in the Arctic. I'm just going to check to see who we have coming through at the moment. Welcome, big, big welcome to schools from the UK and the USA. Uh, we have La Landmark, sorry, Landmark International School in Cambridge, Tuckerton Elementary School in New Jersey, Hawkley Hall High School in Wigan, and the Sapphire Class um, at Lamberhurst St Mary's Primary School. Great to have you here. I'm just going to get us through onto the live chat as well. And Ellie coming as well. Join us. Hello. We'll be taking some of those questions very, very shortly. Who have we, who have we got first up? Uh, so first up, and um, welcome to everybody who's come back and is joining us again for a second or third time. Great to see you all again. Um, and to a couple of new schools as well, so it's great to have some new visitors. Uh, we'll start off with Miss Gibbs class at Landmark International School. Hello to you. Um, and the first question is from Patty Weston, um, who would like Hi, to Patty. know, what clothes and equipment do we need to wear to keep warm? It's a really, really good question. It really depends on what you're doing. We're looking at insulation here. Today is not um, too cold. It's zero Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit or thereabouts. So I've just got a base layer and I'll, I'd be wearing a base layer, whatever the temperature. And this is um, a woolen base layer, thin layer next to the skin. If it's colder, I then put a micro fleece on top of that. Um, colder still, I put a fleece on top of that. Um, colder still, I put this jacket on top of that, and colder still, when we're talking about temperatures uh, down to minus 40, that's the same in Fahrenheit and Celsius. I then put a big down jacket on top of that. Mm -hmm. Same for my legs, uh, a, a thin base layer, then perhaps some fleece, then some over trousers, salopettes made of this, um, two or three pairs of socks, big boots, two or three pairs of gloves. Um, neck warmer, it's really cold, a face guard, face mask, um, and then a potentially a big, my big, uh, very woolly hat. Uh, this, like, uh, not like this one, this one, in fact, um, would go on top. Um, so, goggles, potentially a hood, um, take this off, put a hood up and a, and a smaller hat on, um, and potentially a big, sort of, furry rough as well to keep the, the wind out and the air around my face just a little bit warmer. Mm -hmm. So you can end up wearing, you can't hear anything in here, <laughs> you can end up wearing um, about um, 25, yeah, 20, 25 different items, items of clothing. Yeah, so yeah. Um, quite a few. But really altering your clothing depending on the temperature, the temperature can change quite a lot during the day, and on what you're doing. So if you're standing around or waiting or mm. filming, being quite still, you might want to put on lots of clothes. If you're working quite hard, taking out an ice core and a glacier, then you need less clothes, fewer clothes. And get quite hot quite quickly if you had all those layers on, yeah. digging an igloo or something. And the real problem with being hot in the Arctic 
um, is um, sweating, perspiring, and that um, moisture can get out from your base layers into some of the outer layers of your clothing uh, where it can freeze and not only just have you know walk around wearing ice but also freeze together those insulating layers and so they're a bit rubbish mm. after that. So is it quite dangerous then if you are all kitted up with your multiple layers if you start working and get hot um, maybe is it, is it better to sort of stop for five minutes rather than get hot and think oh okay I'll take all my layers off and then the sweat freezes and then you put your, get cold very quickly and then put it back on. Are you, are you constantly taking layers on and off, on and off, or do you start and stop your work? Which is um, better to do? So, I mean, for instance, if, if I were doing a lot of ice pouring and there wasn't too much of a wind up, um, you take, take this layer off, so mm -hmm. I have a fleece on underneath and you just crack on with that. Mm -hmm. And and then, you, you know, you, the, it's more easy for the uh, moisture to escape. Uh, so it's not freezing to you, Good. although you do end up with a sort of icy back sometimes yeah. with you know that happening. But what the danger is if you've got multiple layers of clothing and you get um, and the moisture can't moisture escape. Can't, yeah. um, so Trapped moisture. Moisture management almost as important as temperature management mm -hmm. in terms of clothing. Yeah, actually, that's a, a very good point, and and I think it's interesting what you mentioned about the fur um, around your face and 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 the hoods will often have yeah. fur. Um, sort of surrounding on them but to trap a little warm pocket of air because otherwise your your eyelashes and your you know the skin on your face can freeze very easily all that moisture coming out of your breath yeah well. I, haven't, I haven't had a problem with um my eyelashes freezing together although you do get the whole sort of frozen drops of of, of ice on them building up sometimes um you can get frost nip um skin freezing on on your on your face on your cheeks nose um get snot calls because your nose tends to run icicles of snot yeah, coming mm. off your moustache. That's delightful. One of one of one of the, um, the joys of being in the polar regions. Um, and then if it's getting really cold, um, and I haven't been at these temperatures, but I've spoken to people where the moisture in your breath um, starts to condense um, further back, and, mm. and then will fall back into your lungs and and, or, and start to choke you. And you end up with quite a lot of fluid you in your lungs and you a have ha it. hacking cough. Yeah, full fluid build up on your so lungs. It's very yeah. dangerous if you're in a remote polar region to have that. Certainly, not great. Mm. And what sort of materials? It must be quite. You've mentioned this quite intelligent material um, that can allow the moisture out but still trap the heat. Is it all intelligent materials, or well, one, one of the great things that you should be able to bank on is that it's not going to rain um, when when we're in the Arctic. Um, hasn't quite worked out that way. So you don't bring waterproof clothing. And the thing about waterproof clothing, if it's hard for the water to get in, it's also hard for the water to get out. So normally the clothing you wear, you wear is windproof, but not not waterproof. Breathable. Um, so that means that, and even if you have a breathe, breathable fabric, or it's a breathable fabric, mm -hmm. um, like Gore-Tex, mm -hmm. you it's, even though it says it's breathable, it's not as breathable as, as this, this mm -hmm. kind of materials. So the more waterproof it is, um, the, the less um, likely it is for, for moisture to be able to get out. And for your base layers, that's all about keeping warm, then there's the option of uh, natural materials like merino wool um, yeah. or eider down, those sorts of things, because the animals kind of got it right, didn't they? They're, they're yeah. used to being warm. Well, we could, we could go and try and collect some eider some out, mm -hmm. out on, the, on the beach. Um, so go and try and collect some wider down. They're an amazing sort of expansion. You should have a tiny ball of wider down and sort of expand this mm -hmm. massively. So you have these massive um, down jackets. You can squeeze right down. You take them out. Yeah. And sleeping bags as well. Down sleeping bags. Yeah. So they're, and they're, they're great. you you sleep with four different layers of sleeping bags um, you, in it in the cold in the tent. You can you can sleep um, with four different layers of sleeping bag. And um, so that's uh, a vapor barrier liner. So that's to stop your, the moisture um, when you're sleeping get, getting into the outer layers. Then a the fleece layer, then a normal sleeping bag. I'll say normal, sort of big, puffy, massive, the biggest sleeping bag you've ever seen in your life. Um, and then an outer layer, which is a bit like this. Mm -hmm. has this nice sort of, um, sort of pile, it's called sort of fleecy material fleecy on the bag. inside. And then a windproof layer on, on the outside. And that's great because your breath condenses on the inside of the tent and you get quite a lot of ice build up and then if you roll over and knock all that down it's quite nice to have a bit of a waterproof layer. Well, um, icy you... shower in the morning. Well you do you do get woken up I mean this this was when sleeping in tents 
um, on the Kaplan um, Arctic Survey of the Ice Base, um, you do get woken up by you sort of knocking ice into your face um, at seven o'clock in the morning or whenever that was. Yeah. So lots of tips on clothing and equipment there for Patty um, for keeping warm. Uh, hopefully that answered your question there. Sophia would like to know uh, how do you travel from place to place? Uh, really depending on what you're doing. Um, so here in the Olesund, um, two types, main types of research um, that can be out on the fjord or it can be on the glaciers. If you're traveling to the glaciers, it's normally by snowmobiles, do, and then out onto the fjord, that's by boat. Brilliant. Uh, Sarah has asked, what's the rarest or most endangered species in the Arctic and have you ever seen it? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the rarest um, species mm. in the Arctic is. That's a really great question. I mean, some, some of the animals that are rare, um, I'm just going to go for my favourite animal, that's the narwhal, um, which I'd really, really <laughs> love to see. Um, so never seen a narwhal, would love to see a narwhal. And what's your description of a narwhal? Well, it's basically a cross between a dolphin and a unicorn. No. A cross between a dolphin and a unicorn, what's not to love? Exactly. Yeah. That would be pretty amazing to see. So uh, maybe on the, in the next couple of days? Probably not, probably <laughs> further up um, on, on, on the sea ice, um, following leads, yeah. um, so that leads are that, those gaps between mm. bits of ice. And if you don't know what a narwhal is, Google one. And, uh, and look at some of the images, because they really are quite extraordinary creatures, aren't they? Yeah, really are, yeah. Right, over now to Tuckerton Elementary School. Welcome back, and that's Miss uh, Starnbau. Um, and we've got a few questions. Lily would like to know, what's the coolest creature you've seen so far? Not the rarest, but the coolest. Uh, the coolest creature is about this big, uh, and it's called the copepod. And copepods are super, 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 super important. And I don't know, maybe we could see on, on the live chat whether you have heard of a copepod. Um, it's a type of zooplankton, and zooplankton and other tiny animals and lava um, that's drift around on the ocean currents. Mm -hmm. And the copepods is the most abundant one. And there's lots and lots and lots and lots of them. How, how many are there? Um, there are, I think, I think I might say about 1,347 billion billion. That's 1,347. And then 18 zeros. 18 zeros. So try writing that number on your on your whiteboard and see how big of a number that is. So this makes up the sort of the base of the food chain yeah. after, the, after the plant life. They're really important because they munch on the plant life, the algae in the water, algae in the water, uh, and then they convert that into sort of sort of basic proteins that mm. allow for mm. for all the larger animals. Um, so you know. In the Arctic, you can go from algae then to copepod, super cool, um, to arctic pod, mm -hmm. to uh, ring seal, and then to a polar bear. So yeah. very quickly, we're getting the sun's energy up to a polar bear yeah. through these fabulous little creatures. I think you have to have a lot of, of copepods to sustain a polar bear mm -hmm. up, up through the food chain. And so um, it was Lily, wasn't it? So if we're trying to convince Lily this is the coolest creature, uh, what about the name copepod? Because that's got quite quite a cool origin, isn't it? Yeah, it, just, it means all-footed. Um, so it's a so rowing oar. Rowing oars. Um, all-footed creature. Um, uh, so that's Greek for all-footed. Mm, pretty cool. Pretty. They were quite sensible, weren't they, when they named all these things? They just said what it did. Just yeah. Just in a different language. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. if you learn your Latin or your Greek, then all of biology becomes very descriptive suddenly, doesn't it? Uh, yes. Mm. Um, I'm not quite sure, sort of, yes, um, learn, learn Latin and Greek, I mean, it make, does make a lot of this a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure that, you know, probably other things to learn first in biology. But... <laughs> no, I think Latin is the most important, and then you understand everything else. Okay. <laughs> okay, so hopefully, Lily, that's uh, made you excited about copepods, and do go and find out some more. Uh, sticking with Tuckerton Elementary School, Olivia wants to know, what do we eat for meals while we're working in the Arctic? I think it's probably... Uh, probably similar to the best school canteen ever. It's really good food. So Neolison is a science village uh, and that means there are a number of different research stations, we're in the UK one, research stations from many different uh, countries and scientists from many different countries too. And we're here, with, there used to be a mining um, settlement and converted to science um, about sort of 40 or so years ago. 
um, but we all um, eat in the central dining hall. Uh, and an amazing selection of um, salads. We had um, pasta and sauce uh, for lunch. Um, fantastic food. Uh, we've had fish and chips, mm. and it was curry night last night in the Arctic. Red deer. Um, red deer. Um, so and sometimes reindeer might reindeer. might be a bit different from your average school canteen. Or whale. Um, well, there has there has been some menke mm. uh, from mm. from time to time um, up here. Yeah. And lots of fresh salmon as well, fresh fish, which is, yes. which is great. Um, just uh, going on to the live stream on YouTube, a big hello to Charlotte, who is watching from Discovery Education. Um, and they are saying they're really enjoying the Q&A and are going to run some uh, news stories um, on Arctic Live next week. So thank you very much, Charlotte, for joining us from Discovery Education. It's great to see um, that collaboration. Should we give Charlotte a sort of look, look outside, so yes, preview. Um, so... One of the one of the, the great joys of, of going outside is we go outside in socks um, <laughs> when we go outside. Um, that's because you have to take off your boots um, coming inside, and then those are at the front door of the station, and we're going at the back door. So if I don't stay out for too too long, it's because my feet are about to freeze off. Oh, winter up a bit. Um, so you can see behind me uh, wonderful, wonderful views. This is uh, the Kong Fjord, uh, the fjord that runs down past the research village here in the Olsen. That glacier you might be able to see um, at the back of the glaciers, it's the Kong and that's about 15 kilometers, uh, about 10 miles away. The wind is actually picking up and just it's just starting to come uh, from the east again. We had some good weather, the wind is coming from the south coming from the east, uh, chilling down, actually feeling more like sort of quite below at the moment. Um, uh, some lovely little burly bits, there's small icebergs, that coming from bits of ice, uh, breaking off uh, the glacial front up there. The research team are just over this snow drift <laughs> on the fjord, um, sampling for plastics, but with this wind coming up, I wouldn't be surprised um, if it's getting less stable for them to be working out there at the moment, and they'll need to come in uh, soon. But they're in radio contact, uh, so we might might hear that over the radio if they need to come in sooner rather than later. Um, but with cold toes, just come back in, keep the draft out. We'll get the uh, camera sorted out again. And then Ellie, I think you're coming to join me, aren't you? Yeah. What sort of we we did have a, a question. We had a question of what temperature is it? So what sort of temperature do you say it's out there, particularly with the wind chill? Ah, uh, you know, moment. it's it's probably just sort of um, minus five Celsius, which mm -hmm. is about um, twenty three Fahrenheit. Um, so so not too chilly, um, but definitely you don't want to stand around in, in your socks for too long. Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, after having uh, told, uh, um, was it Polly, um, Patty, sorry, all about dressing warmly, we've just gone outside in our socks. Yes. So, yeah, not, do not... as we say, not as we do, Patty. Um, okay, brilliant. Uh, so, moving on um, to um, Hawkley Hall High School. Great, um, welcome. Weekend. Welcome back. Um, and this is uh, Miss Lucy Gouveia's class. I apologise if I've pronounce your surname incorrectly. Um, Dylan would like to know what's been your best discovery here so far? Best discovery? I, I think that raises um, one important point and also a, a few things I've, I've thought are completely wonderful. Um, but when you work as a scientist in a place like the Arctic and you're looking at sort of field science, that's when you come and study a part of the planet, the whole sequence and the whole process of science doesn't really allow you to sort of come here and, and wake something out of the water and say we've discovered something. So you start by planning your research, developing your methodology, then coming out into the field, gathering samples, analysing them back at laboratory. In this case, um, a number of universities involved um, in, in using the samples we're collecting 
then analyzing the data you get from those samples, writing that up, submitting it to a science journal, and that's how scientists share their research. And then also that that might sort of get into the news if it's if it's seen to be sort of important enough for a wider audience. And that whole process is a number of months. Um, so it can be quite a long time after you've taken your water sample from the Arctic Ocean to be able to say anything conclusive. Uh, so having said that, um, discoveries, um, I've had some great times exploring some, some unexplored mm -hmm. um, cave systems inside um, the glacier just over here. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it has just been just like another world. Mm -hmm. um, probably not, you know, always, um, you know, you've slightly sort of like, wow, I'm inside this block of ice, 150 feet of ice above mm -hmm. me, 150 feet below. But it's, it's like a, a set from a science fiction mm. film. You said, you described it before as being like a cathedral of ice. Yeah, I mean, very much so. I mean, that's going down the Moulin, which is this big mm. shaft. Um, and we've got a VR video uh, on, on, on our YouTube channel sh sh showing that. And uh, that's sort of repelling abseiling down um, in, in, into the glacier. Um, but it's when you go in through it, there's a small cut. And you go in through a, a small cut um, and then you're sort of walking, um, following a stream path um, through the middle of, of a glacier. And we do have some um, 360 footage from that. We've never put it up mm. because when we watched it, it made us feel sick. People were sort of lurching all around and trying to sort of, mm. sort of get through and everything else. So we'll see if we can yeah. stabilise that and share that at some but, point but in the future. there is a fantastic 360 video of that abseiling, that rappelling down into um, that sort of ice tunnel. and. It's well worth a look because it's very immersive. I think if you want to sort of get a sense of what it feels like to be in that situation, then try and uh, use the 360 um, settings on your phone, for example. Um, yeah, or, you just need one of those sort of Google Cardboard yeah. compatible viewer, um, really and then immersive. that will give you that, that, that sense, a little bit of a sense of what it's like <laughs> to lower yourself um, into the middle of a glacier. So following on from that theme, we've had a really good question, um, this is from Landmark International School, this is from Nathan Morley, um, right. and it's sort of related, because um, he's asked, are you ever scared to go on expedition? Because he says, to me, it looks like it would be scary and totally out of my comfort zone. Uh, I, th I think the, the wonderful thing, um, Nathan, is, is that it, you're right to be scared, mm -hmm. um, and you're right to be nervous, and, and we're all nervous. Um, definitely before our, our first time in the polar regions and even after that because you never quite know what it's going to be like and you never quite know what's going to be happening and you're away from from home and loved ones and uh, it can can make you nervous and it does make make me nervous and and, and others too who've been here many many times uh, but the great thing is I've had the privilege of working with great great people who are highly experienced um, about working and living and, and doing science in the polar regions. Um, and, and that makes you feel much more confident. So Nathan, you know, it's, it's working, working in teams, learning from others. It's a bit like doing an apprenticeship mm. uh, in, in, in where you didn't study to do, to do a job in the, you know, and a lot of jobs still like this, but you actually sort of, you work with someone who who, who's got experience and you work alongside them and you learn sort of on the job. Um, so you're not going to get plonked um, in the middle of the Arctic on your own if you came on an expedition like this. There? There's a lot of preparation but there's also a lot of support mm -hmm. and a lot of wonderful people who, who will guide you um, along, along the road. And I think it's important to mention as well that uh, a lot of places, maybe you go off to Australia and do some bungee jumping or skydiving, all these sorts of adrenaline, thrill-seeking activities. Um, <laughs> and you, and th those are sort of scary things, abseiling and so on. Um, but here in the polar regions, the whole place is so dangerous that actually we don't just run out into the snow and jump into a glacial you know, cave and so on. It, we have to be very careful and very considered and have a lot of respect for the natural environment around us. So it's not just that we're diving out and, and going exploring. Um, I think there is a there is a sort of considered respect that, that goes on, and then you are um, you know going and doing those things that are scary. So uh, 
Definitely using the help of experts and, and making sure that you've got the right people around you. What other advice would you give somebody like Nathan or, or other um, young people who might be watching who, who are scared of going outside of their comfort zones? Because exploration and this sort of thing is great for young people to do and it is important to go out of your comfort zone. What advice would you give Nathan and others? Um, I, mean, I think, I think you, know, you, you raised a number of points there um, and one of the things is you, you're not, we're not taking unnecessary risks. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not we're not bungee jumping. I'd, I'd be absolutely petrified bungee jumping. Mm -hmm. Absolutely scared me stiff. So if anyone out there has been bungee jumping, hats off to you. But um, I think you just do it bit by bit. You build up to it. Mm -hmm. Your first expedition is not across no. yeah. you know the Arctic. Your first expedition. Uh, might be in local woods or hills near where you are. It might be um, with a family. I certainly went out with my family a lot um, when I was younger. And you build up and build up and build up from there. Um, if we get into the technical side of it, and, and teachers will be able to relate to this, you've got your comfort zone and you've got a panic zone. <laughs> and we're not going to drop you straight into the panic zone, but we're just going to you know build up on experiences that's gently build your confidence up to do sort of more complex um, and sort of bigger and bolder um, expeditions in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So um, camping weekends and treks out with family and that sort of oh, thing. Oh, well, we, we uh, was it Nathan? Yes. If Nathan's in, in, in the UK, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh scheme yes. is, is excellent. Absolutely. And I'm not quite sure whether you have that at your school if you don't. Um, it's Landmark International School in Cambridge. There, okay. are, there is a fantastic um, uh, set of walking around Cambridge that I know I've worked with schools in Cambridge that do uh, Duke of Edinburgh. And there's some brilliant walking and camping around there. So ask your teachers and see if you can get out and get started. Perfect. Great advice. Thank you for that. Um, OK, so moving on then. Um, oh, all sorts of questions. Let's go over to Sapphire class at Lamberhurst St Mary's uh, Primary School. Welcome back. Um, and they've asked it's a nice, simple question. How do we get our water? Well, it, it comes from a glacier just over here. Exactly. Very luckily, it comes up out at such high pressure that it's not freezing, mm. and then we can draw it off down there, and that that's plumbed in um, throughout um, the Ollisons throughout the, the village where we are. So it's odd saying a village settlement. Mm. <laughs> it's only it's a collection of buildings, so it, technically it's a village, but it doesn't doesn't really feel big enough to be a village. No. But that's actually why the Ollison is here, yeah. because there's that high pressure, um, almost sort of like a spring. Uh, of water from from the glacier. Otherwise, we we wouldn't be based here. Um, uh, no, no, you you'd, you'd be melting snow, which is mm. quite an endeavour mm. um, to melt enough snow. Um, very often, why you won't wash very much on 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 a polar trip because you're melting enough snow uh, for drinking and for food, mm. um, but there isn't much left um, for bathing. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, right. Okay. Back then to Landmark International School and. Um, uh, Roman has asked a lovely question. What do you find so special about the Arctic, and why? Um, it has to be it has to be the light um, up here. It really does. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get people think the Arctic's white, mm -hmm. and it really, really isn't. I mean, we've had some amazing um, sun near sets. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> because of course the sun doesn't completely set at, at yeah. this time of year. Um, some some sun near sets and it's been sort of the you have the spin drift the sort of like cloudy um, snow blown across mm. the surface um, of the Arctic and the picked out and sort of blues and pinks and golds and it's this it's this really special you get days where the air freezes and it's like walking through sort of like sort of like sort of diamonds you get days where you get a sun column so that mm. the the sun looks like a sort of Big column instead of instead of, a, sort of an orb. You get the the northern lights, um, get the amazing ethereal sort of greens and purples um, in the sky. It's never as vivid as you see in the photographs. It's always slightly more ghostly, mm -hmm. uh, but it does just suddenly fill the whole sky with uh, a shimmering uh, wonder. So it, it, it's it's the light here. Um, yeah, it's it's not a white sort of expanse of dreariness. Um, it's an amazingly colourful mm. and uh, delight delightful place. I I think the colours of the icebergs are amazing because they're such vivid blue. Yeah. And sometimes with the boat, when we go out on the research boat, 
it gets quite close to the icebergs, it goes through the iceberg field, so sort of navigating through lots of icebergs, you get quite close to them, and they look almost like they're sort of blue plastic from a film set, they look like they're painted or, or fake, they can't be real, but they just are such vivid blue, and we've got a couple of photographs of those which um, we can post on our social media so you can have a look. Brilliant. So yeah, good question. Uh, right, back to Tuckerton Elementary School, and this time... Ah, uh, Mrs. S, so this is Mrs. Uh, Stambau, has asked what, which countries are represented on our scientists' team, and then perhaps we can maybe talk about the different stations here as well. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So our science team here this year um, is from the University of Exeter uh, in the UK, and so, and I don't know, like I said, we're all British, I don't, we don't know whether all English. All British, certainly. All British. So we're, we're currently on, on, on an all British team at the moment, and that, that's being based with the science um, at Plymouth and Exeter in the UK. But here in the Odessons, I don't know how many nationalities there'd be here at the moment. At least 20. Yeah. Um, so there's a South Korean station, there's a Chinese station, there's a German station, Dutch. French. French, Italian have we done, yeah. Norwegian. Um, Indian, um, how many have we got there? Eight or nine? Eight or nine, and UK, there we go, ten. Ten, at least. At least but ten. those I stations... And then more nationalities coming yeah. in, into those stations. So yeah. there may be other nationalities working through that station. It's very, very international. Very international, yeah. yeah. So hopefully that answered your question. And sticking with Tuckerton, uh, Michael, what's the biggest creature you've seen in the Arctic? <laughs> so we've had the rarest, the coolest, what's the biggest? The biggest, I mean, I know the team saw a walrus on the way back from sampling yesterday, and we, we were in the studio, uh, so that's probably the biggest seen, seen by the team up here. Um, the biggest I've seen is probably a reindeer, <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of reindeer, just, just on the foreshore, um, just on the edge of the fjord. Um, so I have not been that lucky on, on wildlife spotting um, a seal. I mean, I, one trip we saw four animals. Mm. Um, in, in four weeks, I think. Uh, four actual animals, not four different types, yeah. but four, four, four individuals. individuals. Um, so, so I haven't really been, been blessed with a, a wide amount of wildlife mm. spotting. I should come back in the summer when there's more life in the fjord and apparently mm. you get uh, blue whales up here, mm. uh, the biggest animal that has ever lived on this planet. Mm. That would be amazing to that see a blue amazing. whale in this fjord as well. It would be amazing. It'd be incredible. Um, okay, and then finally from Tuckerton Elementary, we've got Jacob, um, who's asked, is there pollution in the Arctic seas? Big question there. Um, and that's something that we're looking at at, at the moment. We're looking at, is there any, and if there is, um, how much? So the pollution we're looking at is microplastics. Um, and so in a number of months, having gone through the scientific process, we will be able to tell you the results from Kongsfjorden but other um, research projects are, are definitely reporting um, that there are, are high amounts of microplastics mm -hmm. in the Arctic. And we're also joined on the live feed by um, Children's International School in Lagos again. Welcome back. Good to see you. Um, right. And they've asked sort of a similar question, really. Can we provide feedback on the outcome of the research that we're carrying out? Definitely. Not, not definitely. yet, but when. Um, Depends how hard, you know, Nick, Katie and Clara have worked when they get back to Exeter. Um, so it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be a number of months. It's not going to be some days or weeks. It's going to be a number of months. We also have to send the samples back. Yeah. So there's a whole logistics um, issue as well. Uh, we're currently debating whether we can take um, dry ice in, and mm. some of the samples. In fact, in this, this box underneath me at the moment, my seat. You can't see, but we're sitting on the chests and, and um, sealed, weather sealed boxes, which are used for transporting. And if you, if you pack frozen samples um, with dry ice to keep them frozen on the journey uh, back to the UK, you also, have, of course, have to drill a hole into your box um, because as the um, dry ice melts, so that's frozen carbon dioxide, expands quite a lot. Um, and then you need to put a um, marker pen around the hole because there'll be smoke coming out of it, essentially. It's all sort of you know, what looks like smoke. And saying that you know, do not this lock is this. Ice. This is dry ice, yeah. and all these sort of like um, sort of messages to um, not the best thing to take on a plane, really, is it? A, a, a smoking sealed box, no. for expanding carbon dioxide. 
Um, but it but it is done with the, the I mean, you know, this is not made up. This is <laughs> we'll be following the sort of regulations and it, you know, for from for moving frozen samples there are sort of ways and means of, mm. of doing it. Um but it, it, it can appear um on, on a you know, first look um to be potentially alarming when in fact it's it quite a standard yeah. way. Well especially here as well, flights out of this region because this is a science village, so Pretty much everybody come, going home from here is taking some form of samples with them. So that might be glass bottles or jars or sealed chemicals. So a lot of the, the samples that come back have to be transported in a very careful way. Yeah, and, and there's, there'll be ships coming in. So yeah. for those more more sort of toxic or delicate samples or, 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 or heavier samples, there'll be ships mm -hmm. coming in that will we'll be able to help with that. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a great question about when, you know, can we can we look at a sample and, and determine our research? In this case, because we're looking at acidification and plastic microplastics, we can't actually see. But even if we were looking at something that was visible, you still wouldn't be able to look at your data in the field and, and make any conclusions because you have to go back and do further analysis, get it checked by um, other people in your field, as Jamie said, and and also look at it month on month or year on year to see if it's a trend or if it's a one-off. So it's always quite a, a slow process, isn't it? It is, and, and we'll be coming back um, next year and the year after to, to see how things might be changing. So there'll, there'll, there'll be a, a, a story in the data um, that gets gathered over that time. And uh, on that note, uh, we do have another live investigation looking at microplastics, and in that we're going to be talking about some of the sampling methods and the process of how do you go about finding microplastics. And so good morning to Livingston High School in New Jersey who've just joined us on the live feed saying they're looking forward to that experiment. Oh, great. Today. So that's brilliant. We are too. Staying with us for that. Okay, so let's then head on over to um, Hawkley Hall High School, let's head back to them. And uh, yes, yeah, so Katie has asked what type of experiments do we carry out? So maybe in terms of the actual kind of uh, testing that we're actually doing? Um, certainly, so what we're doing here is we're doing a couple of things. First of all, we are sampling, and that means collecting um, two things. We're collecting water samples, um, so we are taking water from different depths and different places in the, in the fjord, and then those will be tested for, the, for chemical analysis to tell us about the ocean chemistry, and that's part of the ocean acidification mm -hmm. work that we're doing. Um, we'll also be getting um, trawling samples, and that will contain microplastics and plankton. Um, and as Ellie was saying, those plastic particles are so small, so fractions of a millimetre, that to actually identify them and to count them, that needs to be done under a microscope um, back at the laboratory, back, back at the University of Exeter in this case. And then we'll also be leaving um, some experiments here to see how ocean acidification mm -hmm. could affect the life on a, and the different types of life that you might find in the fjord and whether different animals respond in different ways. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to look at that when we come back next year. Brilliant, very exciting stuff. Um, and another Katie, I assume it's another Katie, has asked uh, how are you able to withstand such low temperatures in the Arctic? We've talked a bit about the clothing and the equipment, but um, how about sort of in terms of going about your day to day and the machinery and that sort of thing that we use? Um, well, I think I think there's that piece, and I think there's also talking about you know it, it's good good clothing, um, good shelter because sometimes the weather is just mucky and you can't get out. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very lucky here to have the shelter of the UK Arctic Research Station. Um, but you might be in a tent, I and mean, you want that tent to be a good tent, um, because if it's blowing an absolute you storm might be stuck out there, for you several days, st stuck for longer. several days, um, and not be able to do any work. And the last thing is is, is good food, um, mm -hmm. and and of course the fuel needed to cook that and to melt melt snow. Um, so those 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 are the things you just really need um, to to stay warm. Um, you can just think about clothing, um, but I would say it, it's good clothing, good shelter good food and having the fuel um, to, to make sure that you can eat and drink properly. And the most important is a sense of humour. A sense of humour, <laughs> yeah. Okay, and that leads on very nicely to Harvey, Edwin and Robbie's question, who all would like to know what do we eat and how do we cook it? 
Uh, we're very, very lucky um, to have the canteen um, o o over here. What would you do if you were going to one of the more remote research huts or, for example, down in Antarctica, where, where if you weren't at the station like this, we're lucky to have a canteen? Um, the type of food that you would take, um, it has to be have high calorie value uh, for its weight. Um, so what you really don't want to find um, in, in your food is stuff like lettuce, great, lots of vitamins, keeps you healthy, rubbish for calorie weight ratios. Um, I think we worked out if you need about, if you say you're walking to the pole mm -hmm. and it takes sort of 50 days, mm -hmm. for instance, and you need um, 8,000 calories a day, um, that is, how are you going to help me with my maths here, that is 400,000 calories. Yeah. 400,000 calories in lettuce um, would I pretty well several, full, full, fill this room. This is tons several tons of lettuce. Tons of lettuce. <laughs> so, not a good idea. Great to keep you healthy at home, rubbish uh, for a polar trip. Um, what you'll be looking at are very high calorie um, substances. Fats, awesome, because um, that's got the highest um, calorie to weight ratio mm -hmm. of any of the food types. Um, so, we'd have a, 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 a packet of butter in our stews or soups. So you're, you're melting an entire pack of butter or putting it in and it into melts. your soup. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's for eight of us. Yeah, uh, this this is not recommended. Um, don't all. don't have this at home. Uh, because these these are very um, high calorie rich diets for a very particular purpose mm. um, and, and not suitable for for an everyday diet. Um, and then chocolates, none of that sort of you know nice sort of smart dark chocolate. Mm not enough calories, switch milky, it up to the milky, sugary, buttery, buttery chocolate. Mm. Um, and then lots of good hearty foods, you also get the freeze dried foods, so mm. you're not carrying around water with you. Yeah. Um, so you're just carrying fuel to melt the snow to cook your food. Um, also dry, dried nuts and that, that kind of thing. So I think it's uh, only 86 kilos of peanut butter or something to get to the North Pole. Today. There's Eight a good fun fact for you. Um, so, so one of the fun things you can do is try and work out um, what the lightest way you could get, mm. I don't know, 50,000 calories um, together, what is the lightest mm. way you can do that? Really and, and still having a bit of a balanced diet because you, you you've got to have some... You can't some just be eating sort of like, you know... Solid peanut butter chocolate. Solid peanut butter the whole time. Uh, yeah, a sort of chocolate and peanut butter sandwich. Um, not not necessarily the way to go. Especially not for 50 days. Especially not for, mm. no. So a bit of a mix, but certainly high energy. So hopefully that answered the, the boy's question there. Um, and another question from Ellie, great name. Um, what's your favourite part of going to the Arctic? Favourite part of coming to the Arctic is it's stunningly beautiful and I get to work with awesome people. Good. Is that, yeah, yeah, that's nice it. That's right it. <laughs> beautiful, Two very good reasons. beautiful, and awesome people. Okay, uh, so then back over to the school, the Children's International School in Lagos, on the live feed. Great. Um, what factors determine where and what you do your research on? Good uh, really, really good question. Um, so, being a part of a of a number of research expeditions, um, the Ollison's great because we're next to the fjord here, so it's quite easy mm -hmm. to do. Um, some long-term marine sampling, so coming back to the same place again and again. And so what we're interested in is how human activity is impacting uh, the water in the Arctic, the ocean in the Arctic, and so New Orleans is great for that insofar as we can get out, do the plastics trawling, um, do some of the ocean acidification research here, um, and no, it's, it's great. So, so interested in, in, in how the oceans are changing, and um, what um, humans are doing to contribute to that, and the Arctic is a great place. It's also really great for ocean acidification research because um, ocean acidification is happening to nearly twice as fast here mm. than it is in other parts of the world. It's happening faster in colder waters. And that's because it's colder water holds on to uh, carbon dioxide yeah. more easily. Exactly. Um, and uh, so that, that's a good reason to come here. And then with the, um, the plastics piece, it could be that um, you know, the sources of plastics, sort of potentially in Europe and, and elsewhere, are ending up um, in the Arctic. And, and once you get to the top of the world, there's not, not really any other places to go. 
So, so this is where all the currents are flowing and you know, this could potentially We have the, the, the North Atlantic um, current bringing, mm -hmm. bringing that up um, from, from, from Europe. So it's seeing whether it's, it's collecting and uh, concentrating in the Arctic. Hence why there's so many research teams here, because it is a very uh, unique sort of situation. Um, okay, so we're running out of time, but just the last couple of questions, going back to Sapphire class at Lamberhurst, yeah. um, and they've asked more sort of personal questions for you. So uh, uh, what do you do when you have spare time, and do you get to talk to your family? Um, we, have, we have a lot of spare time um, up here. Um, and current, currently, we're, we're thinking about putting on on a play. No, we have no spare time. <laughs> we have no spare time at all. It would be a good uh, play, though. It would it? be a good play. I don't wonder what kind of play we put on. Um, so, um, in terms of work days, it's a, only a touch longer than being a teacher, mm -hmm. um, but it is probably at the moment um, sixteen to eighteen hour um, work days, um, and that's for two weeks. Um, what was the, what was like, the do you one? get to talk to your family? Um, not as much as I would like, um, so, so I do miss them. So, uh, miss them lots. Um, so, but seeing them very soon. Yeah. And, and on that note, then final question: Would you recommend doing your job? Oh, it's awesome. It's very, very tiring, um, but absolutely awesome. It's a massive privilege um, to come to somewhere as beautiful as the Arctic. Uh, to work with great people and to be able to share it with you guys. I mean, the ability to share it with you back in the classroom um, in countries around the world makes, makes this all worthwhile. Uh, it is a really difficult place to get to, mm -hmm. and it's probably not on your list of school trips for next year, but it is stunning, it is important, um, and I'd, I'd just love you to get some sense of what it's like. Fantastic. So on that note, we'll um, I'll, I'll leave uh, Jamie to say goodbye. Um, but thank you very much. That's Landmark International School in Cambridge, Tuckerton Elementary in New Jersey, Hawkley Hall High in Wigan, and Sapphire Class at Lamberhurst in St Mary's. And of course, we've got um, uh, Livingston High School in New Jersey as well. And um, oh, we just had a, a very late message saying good afternoon from Scotland. Have joined us. That's just popped up. Hello. Probably similar weather there actually, as it is here, um, and uh, of course uh, the Children's International School in Lagos as well, thank you very much. So I'm going to pop back and have a camera, Well, thank you again, as I said before, uh, for taking part in this Arctic Live session. It's been really wonderful having you um, here, it feels like you're sort of here, here in the Arctic with us. Um, we've got three more sessions today. We've got a live investigation about sampling for microplastics uh, in sea ice. We've then got, that's in an hour's time, in three hours' time, we have an interview with Nick Scott, one of the plastics research team here at the UK Arctic Research Station. And then we have to finish off today in five hours' time and ask me anything session, another open Q&A. Uh, probably timing is more suited to those schools and classes joining us from North America. But thank you so much for being part of Excel Kaplan Arctic Live. Until the next time, it's goodbye from the Arctic. Goodbye.